The following half-hour show is a paid political program and is not endorsed by this station, management, or staff. The following program is sponsored by Excalibur Insurance Management Services. We'd like to welcome all of you back to the 10th year of the Volpe Report. We hope you all had a wonderful holiday and that Santa was good to all of you. We are very excited to start our 10th season with a regular guest, newly minted Pennsylvania Senator Greg Rothman who represents Pennsylvania's 34th Senatorial District. You may remember that Senator Rothman had been in leadership in the Republican House, where he served as Deputy Chairman of the House Policy Committee, as well as Chairman of the House Republican Campaign Committee. Prior to his public service, Senator Rothman served in the Marine Corps during Operation Desert Storm. Afterward, he served 10 years in the Marine Corps Reserve. His military service led to his appointment by President of the United States, George W. Bush, to the National Veterans Business Development Corporation. Greg was born in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and graduated from Cumberland Valley High School, and then went on to receive his political science degree from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. He would later go on to receive his master's degree from Johns Hopkins University. On today's show, we will discuss his new office, as well as his insider's view of the historic events that occurred in the House of Representatives, where Pennsylvania Representative Mark Rossi had been elected Speaker of the House of Representatives after it appeared that the Majority Leader, Joanna McClinton, would get the post. It didn't work out that way. and It'll be very interesting to hear what palace intrigue went on behind closed doors to produce that result. This is the Volpe Report, a weekly news and political interview show examining the latest local, state, and national issues with Chuck Volpe. Insightful, informative, controversial. The area's premier political talk show, The Volpe Report. Senator Rothman, welcome to The Volpe Report. Thanks for having me, Chuck. Well, uh, I know I had you on in the fall, you were my first show after our uh, uh, usual summer siesta, for lack of a better word. And uh, we talked on that show about you were in the middle of your campaign for Senator of Pennsylvania, which you now hold. You were sworn in today. So let me uh, be the, late, the last, probably, in a bunch of well-wishers and fans of Greg Rothman to congratulate you on your Senate victory and being sworn in as a Senator of Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you. It's quite an honor. It, 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 it is. And uh, we are in good hands in the Pennsylvania Senate. And since you've been on my show four or five or six times, at least going back several years, uh, uh, having been in the House and been in leadership in the House of Representatives for the Republican Party's leadership group, and then becoming chairman of the House Republican Campaign Committee, which you were for a couple of years, uh, one, of the, one of the things we had talked about uh, was if the party was going to be in good hands because you were no longer, obviously, the chairman since you were running for senator. And we now have the answer, and it wasn't in such good hands <laughs> since, since the Republicans lost the House of Representatives by one vote. And uh, so, you know, where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio, I think, is that, that song. The Republican Party turns its lonely eyes to you. Well, it, it, it didn't help that we had a very partisan uh gerrymandering redistricting that uh Agreed. took my house seat that i was honored to represent for seven years and put it into three different house seats <laughs> uh, which, which allowed the democrats to pick up a seat so right. there's a lot of a lot of you know gerrymandering going on from the democratic side which look that's politics chuck and that's what i've always said about gerrymandering if you're in the majority you get to draw the maps and right. Uh, the fair districts people have been awful quiet, though. They haven't heard a peep about these strange shaped districts. And my district, they took one of my parts of my district and they crossed a river. So what I did represent when I woke up the day after the map was drawn, only 18 percent of my district was the same. So wow. that's because I ran for the Senate and because uh, I want to represent the people that I grew up with. I've lived sure. around all my life. So but yeah, it's um, it's disappointing that the Republicans have temporarily, uh, or at some point, I, I guess, we'll uh, uh, lose the majority. But right now, very interesting um, press, uh, uh, 
brand new precedent, uh, historical uh, actions going on in the House of Representatives, just just hot off the press. Just, right, just and, and, and we're going to catch up with your take on that because of your view inside that chamber and leadership. You know kind of who some of the bodies are buried and some of my names that I'll throw at you. You can kind of tell the viewers of all of Northeast and Central Pennsylvania in our media market, a third of the state basically, what happened. But a hypothesis I understand because you're being sworn in as a senator while this is going on. But your insights will be, I'm sure, profound and, 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 and very good. But let's get back a little bit to a couple of points you've already made, Senator, and that's this. One is, myself included, I didn't pay quite attention to the historical importance going back to, I want to say, 2015, when it was unprecedented that all three Republican statewide candidates for Supreme Court of Pennsylvania lost. And for the first time ever, in a clean sweep, all three Democrats won. And that really tipped the body into a majority for the Democrats. And the danger always was they were kind of the tie-breaking vote if, if the two selected by the Republican leadership and the two selected by the Democratic leadership cannot agree uh, uh, on the fifth spot. And ultimately, you know, the Supreme Court ends up having a vote in that. But even worse, if you can't agree uh, across all lines, they end up drawing their own map, which is what they did. But, but obviously, that, though the seeds were born that day and carried on the wind future into 2020, which allowed the Democrats to do the redistricting they did. And we end up with a Democratic Supreme Court drawing the maps, which, so first, your thoughts on the constitutionality. I don't know if the Pennsylvania Constitution allows for what actually took place. So let me get your thoughts on that question. Well, yeah, if there's a, if, if they can't agree to the fifth member, so that the redistricting commission is made up of the leaders of both House and Senate, Democrat and Republican, if right. they can't agree on the fifth, then the courts pick it. And in this case, um, the, the pick was um, the, the former chancellor from Pittsburgh. Nordberg. Uh, Nordberg. Yeah. And, and, and look, um, generally what's supposed to happen, which, you know, you, you understand negotiation is, leaders are supposed to get in a room and work things out and they go over and, and um, here's what I would like. And here's, you know, what, what do we think? And, and the Nordenberg or the, the fifth member is there to break ties. Uh, but when it came to the house negotiations, unlike the Senate and the Senate, it looks like the leaderships work well together and, and leader Ward and uh, leader Coster came up with a plan and they generally agreed to the map. I mean, ultimately they didn't need a tie breaking, but, um, the Democrats did not negotiate with Peter Benninghoff at all, did not did not seek his input, did not have discussions with him, just said, this is the map we want. And when we tried to say, wait a minute, what about this? Or you've met, you know, they had members, uh, I think a half dozen of our members running against each other. I mean, that's, you know, that's a way to change the, the, the uh, makeup of the legislature, put two Republican members against each other. Uh, and in those cases, Nordenberg voted with the Democrats and there, and we, you know, wasn't the tiebreaker. Uh, or was a tiebreaker um, right. in a partisan way. So, right. um, but look, politics is about the future. Uh, elections are the, the way, if you don't like the last election, your recourse is to move on to the next. And you know, I think it's time for the Republican Party to move on and, and let's let's win the next elections. And let's let's do things right now for the next two or four years that the Republican, that the, the Republicans should do things that the voters will want to vote for us. Um, for instance, I will tell you that right before we left the last session, a bill that I had introduced when I first got here, the first bill I introduced, which was to cut the corporate net income tax. And you and I talked about that. It was the second highest in the country. Um, and I introduced a bill to cut it. And uh, the governor actually signed a version of that bill in the budget to cut the corporate net income tax. Now look, Republicans since the days of Ronald Reagan and Jack Kemp have been talking about tax cuts. Right. And yet, we didn't spend any time talking about this tax cut. Instead, Governor Wolf around the state talking about his tax cut. It wasn't his tax cut. It was the Republicans' tax cut. <laughs> of anyway, there's a lot of things we can do, and uh, um, we, we need to be, um, you know, act, have an, an active agenda and uh, do things to help the people of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and then we'll win elections. We'll win back the majority again. Well, well Senator, you know, the Republican Party was clearly not helped by a candidate at the top of the ticket for governor that got, for lack of a better word, obliterated 
in, 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 in record fashion. 15 percentage points is unthinkable. I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have lost the House either. As bad as the districts were drawn, there were enough close races that if you didn't get that huge push by Shapiro with the coattails he had, and the money he spent down ticket, as you're well aware, to, in those seats, if it was only, it's only one vote, well, I'm pretty sure the Republicans and Brian Cutler would, would still be the speaker. But I also want to yeah, add this comment. I'm sorry, you go first. No, no, I was just going to say, it starts early on in the primary system where the Democrats coalesce behind, coalesce behind their best candidate in Josh Shapiro, and he didn't have a primary opponent, which means not only did he not have to spend any money to win a primary, but he had nobody attacking him from his base of his party, where we had, what, eight, nine, ten people running? Twelve. Um, it went down to nine. <laughs> Twelve, you're right. And and they spent the entire time attacking each other. And I prescribed to Ronald Reagan's 11th commandment, which you don't attack, Republicans shouldn't attack each other. <laughs> right. and, and, and so... So I think that our problem started back then. And, and I was, look, I wasn't alone, but I was one of the people saying, look, we need to narrow this field down to a couple of our best candidates or a few of the best candidates. I'm all for primaries, but let's let's stay positive and, and talk about what we want to do, not what's wrong with the other person. Uh, uh, agreed. And uh, uh, I've got on record saying, I think that uh, former U.S. Congressman Lou Barletta or U.S. Attorney and Federal Prosecutor Bill McSwain not only would have had, had, had a chance to win, had they been the nominee, even in a narrow defeat, we'd probably get Oz in the U.S. Senate. we probably still have a House majority in Pennsylvania's General Assembly, a Republican majority, and we have two or maybe three U.S. congressional seats that probably would have gone Republican that were photo finishes. So, uh, you know, there, were, there was collateral damage with, with former President uh, Donald Trump sticking his nose into Pennsylvania and endorsing and swaying the outcome of those primaries, clearly. And uh, we ended up with undesirable candidates, especially the one at the top of the ticket. Yeah, elections have consequences. And uh, but look, I, I trust the voters of Pennsylvania. You know, they, they generally figure it out. And, uh, um, you know, it's, it's a new day and it's January. We just celebrated New Year's Eve. And you know, we're looking forward to a new year and I'm always optimistic. That's just who I am. And so, you know, I think we should uh, listen to the voters and say, look, we want you guys to get some stuff done and we want you to um, learn how to govern in a, in a way that, um, you know, has civility and kindness. That's what I've been talking about. I've been talking about that the, the entire time I've been here and, and negotiate instead of doing battle. And um, I said in my farewell speech to the House, I said, um, the, the people of Pennsylvania are cynical about government because of the way government treats them. But they're cynical about politics because of the way politicians treat each other. And so, so we need to have a little more honor in the way Democrats and Republicans talk to each other and do it in a respectful way and do it in a way that, with civility because that's the key to this democratic society um, is, is to, to a way to communicate, just like the free market deals with each other. If the measure of a man, as I've read, is by who their enemies are, you must have done a hell of a job as the HRCC chairman because they vaporized your district. So they did. Yes. They don't do that I, to just anybody. Well, I thanked him because now I get to be a senator. <laughs> it, it, exactly right. It, and in the majority, by the way. So That's right. You always yeah. trade so up. We have, a new, we, have a new, we have a new president pro tem that's historic, too. So I know. Hopefully about her when we come back. Yeah, Senator Kim Ward, I uh, know her well from all of my Western, uh, you know, my, my audience kind of knows uh, I've been, uh, uh, you know, taken in by the Western part of the state and as in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County. Uh, Rich Fitzgerald, their Democratic County executive, said, Chuck, you're one of us. So I kind of have that dual citizenship. So I do know Kim very well from a long, long way back. We insure Westmoreland County, so, you know, and that's where she's from. So, uh, yeah, she's been a friend for a long time. Uh, you're in good hands. But we're going to take a quick break, Greg. U.S. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas has repeatedly stated that our southern border is secure and has told lawmakers that his agency has the situation under control. Wow. When one examines statistics from the U.S. Customs and Border Control, 
One finds that the influx of illegal migrants has had an exponential increase of illegal border crossings. 2.4 million last year alone, the most ever. I don't know where, secretary, where the secretary is getting his information, but according to Border Patrol's own website, illegal crossings in all the border states have been on the increase since Joe Biden took office nearly two years ago. No surprise, because he telegraphed for them to come. Texas, California, New Mexico, and Arizona all had significant increases. With Texas having the smallest and New Mexico having the largest with a 45% increase. The situation is so dire in one Texas town, it recently released 700 detainees directly into city streets. Facility overcrowding was blamed for the release. It's not safe and it creates a dangerous situation for migrants and communities, officials say. In Arizona, shelters have been operating well beyond their intended capacity. And while the Biden administration maintains the border crisis is secure, the historic pace of crossings at the border into the United States has bolstered the narrative of Republicans who have criticized President Joe Biden and the Democrats over their border security policies and their refusal to restore the Trump era restrictions. As migrants head to the border in droves, the United States asylum request backlog is nearly 1.6 million people, the highest on record. It will take years to eliminate. With record numbers of illegal border crossings and record numbers of illicit drugs being confiscated at our borders, Secretary Mayorkas should immediately be called before a congressional committee under oath to give real answers to the American people and to be held into account for the ongoing catastrophe. Of course, then there is Vice President Kamala Harris. Her convoluted explanation on national broadcast television that the border is secure is beyond comical. By the time she was done explaining herself, you could have made a credible argument for the application of the 25th Amendment and remove her from office for mental incapacity. Even far left progressive journalists like Maureen Dowd of the New York Times have conceded the border is a fiasco and that putting Kamala Harris charge in charge was a joke. My father had an expression that is appropriate here and would apply to the Biden administration. Quote, don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining outside. Welcome back, Senator. Uh, I think at this point, we kind of alluded to it earlier. Right now, there is harmony and decorum, which is always unusual for any chamber, honestly, in the Pennsylvania General Assembly. But basically, we have honor and decorum in the Pennsylvania Senate where you now sit as a full-fledged sworn-in senator. That is not the case, uh, in the, in the, as it's referred to as the lower chamber, in the House of Representatives in the Pennsylvania General Assembly. And I think we're into historic territory here. The Republicans are in the situation, or I should say maybe better, the Democrats, they won the majority, but when they showed up today to get sworn in for whatever year of the General Assembly year it is, a new term, they were actually in the minority. And there cannot be a special election at the quickest, probably in a couple months time, which means when all the leadership positions after the swearing in were voted on, they didn't have the votes for speaker. Now, one other uh, uh, facet to this conversation. As my audience knows, uh, representative, in fact, minority leader, Joanna McClinton was on this show in December after November 8th, and we openly discussed her probably becoming the next Speaker of the House of Representatives. Well, what happened apparently, after we shot that show and it aired, I read in the newspaper like everybody did, although you knew as a member, that apparently there was a power grab that she attempted and tried to get herself basically to take the Speaker's job before any votes or swearing in on the new General Assembly, which didn't sit well and rankled a lot of Republicans. So with that as background, we were heading in today swearing in that you really needed a scorecard to tell who the players were, and it had it portended a potential circus. So now there is actually breaking news. Apparently, I've been handed a note by our crack crew here at Fox Studios that we now have a speaker in Pennsylvania. It is not Democrat Joanna McClinton. So talk about 
I, again, I understand you sit in a Senate chamber, which is down in the other far end, long walk to the other end of the Capitol. But you were a leader there for four years. You were the former Republican chairman of the House Republican Campaign Committee. And if anybody can give some real expert insight as to where the bodies are buried, it's Senator Greg Rothman. So you take it from there. The floor is yours. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the House, um, as you, the only correction is Austin Davis ran for both his House seat and lieutenant governor at the same time. Oh, yes. And, it was correct. And then Summer Lee ran for both her House seat and her congressional seat at the same time. Like why? I mean, the... the I don't know. That wouldn't work where I live. I mean, it, it, and it really wasn't fair to the voter. I mean, the Democrats put themselves in the position where today there were 99 Democrats there and 101 Republicans. Uh, the they ended up having a vote where the Republicans nominated uh, Mark Rossi, who is from Berks County. Mark is a good guy. He's a, a solid legislator, great softball player. Um, and is well respected on, on both sides of the aisle. Certainly in our caucus, uh, he's respected. And our leadership, along with a couple of our members, voted with all the Democrats to make Mark Rossi the leader. Now, there may have been, I, I again, I was across the hall in the Senate. Um, there may have been some deals cut of when the, when the elections are going to be, but um, and now I'm thinking Mark Rossi announced he is not going to caucus with the Democrats. He's not going to caucus with the Republicans. He's going to be an independent, meaning party affiliation independent and be an independent speaker. Uh, and that he will help bring bipartisanship and bring people together, which he certainly has the ability to do. And so while there was originally some talk that there might be a placeholder uh, or elect a Republican speaker now, and then when you win the special elections, uh, my old friend who I came in together with, Representative McClinton, would become the, uh, the speaker. Well, at this point, it's quite possible that Mark Rossi finishes out the term as speaker, because even if the Democrats win all three of the special elections, which they are Democratic-leaning seats, the total would be 102 to 101 Democrats and Republicans. But really, it's 101 to 101 because Mark Rossi is an independent now. And if he votes with the Republicans, now, to complicate matters, and you mentioned a scorecard, Linda Culver, state representative, is running for the state Senate. So there will be a vacancy in that seat that's possible, too. So is she a Democrat? You, she's a Republican. Republican. Okay. So she'll leave. So that will be 101 to 100. Well, it'll be 99 to 100. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm very glad I'm in the Senate now. But uh, <laughs> Mark Rossi has no reason to give up the speakership. And even if, even if there was a call to replace him, uh, unless he steps down, the vote totals 100 Democrats, 100 Republicans, and Rossi would vote for himself. And, you know, being speaker is a pretty important position. Sure. And uh, look, you, you heard what I said in the first segment. I'm all about civility. And if, if Mark can bring some civility, um, he mentioned in his acceptance speech as speaker that the fastest growing political affiliation in our Commonwealth is independence. My own Senate district has about 15 percent independence. Wow. And my district uh, even had more than that. So um, you're seeing the voters sometimes say, look, we want you guys to get along. And if Mark Rossi can do that as speaker, I wish him well. I mean, I, I consider him a friend and I wish him well. And so it's certainly interesting times in, in Harrisburg. But um, I'm really excited about our leadership team in the Senate. You know, as, as you mentioned, uh, President Pro Tem, Madam President Kim Ward, you've got a, a long relationship with her. I, I go way back with her, too probably 15, 16 years. Wow. And Joe Pittman, our leader from Indiana County, is just um, really, really a, a top-notch leadership team. So I'm excited to be part of that that team, too, in the, in the Senate and and help work together. And and look, I'm optimistic about the governor, too. He, he made some uh, overtures to Republicans on, on being opposed to Reggie, um, the Greenhouse Initiative, uh, in favor of some school choice legislation, which I'm all for. I mean, he certainly talked about cutting tax rates um, so I'm, I'm going to um, I'm going to be optimistic about our governor, too. Well, uh, I think we all are, uh, Greg, as Pennsylvanians after the acrimony of eight years of Tom Wolf. And I agree wholeheartedly. Once you see uh, governor elect Josh Shapiro getting criticized by the far left progressive Democratic wing and editorialized negatively in the Philadelphia Inquirer uh, uh, by guys like Max Boot and other and others, uh, 
Actually, one quote was there's blood on the sidewalks from progressives biting their lips in Pennsylvania because of how far to the right their governor-elect Josh Shapiro that they helped elect has gone. That bodes well for the future of this commonwealth. And uh, you'll be a key and integral player. I had to tell you one little as, bef as before we head off the air. Back to your point, and I think it's a prescient point about what could happen with Representative Rossi once he is now, as Speaker of the House, has that powerful position. And I'll give you a quick example. Uh, back in the day, and I'm going back a little ways, and again, I've talked about my affiliation with Pittsburgh and Allegheny County and my father before me. Uh, we were one of the largest insurance carriers. We insured the city of Pittsburgh and Allegheny County for their workers' comp. So we were connected to county and city government, along with mayor at the time, Dick Caligiri, who tragically, if you remember, passed away in his term. And there's a beautiful statue of him outside the city hall in Pittsburgh, their big municipal building on Grant Street. Well, at that time, the odds on future heir was a, a gentleman who I believe was a, a county elected official, county controller, a guy named Frank Lucchino, who wanted to be mayor and was going to run for it. And the other one was, I believe, president of Pittsburgh Council at the time, a woman named Sophie Maslow, the councilwoman. And the Democratic Party was split right down the middle. So they cut a deal, maybe kind of what happened in the chamber down to your left down there. And the deal was this. Frank Lokino would withdraw and allow Sophie Masloff to become the mayor on appointment until they can have their election. And then she would not run for the seat when it came up for election, and he would have a clear path and become the next mayor of Pittsburgh. Everybody shook. The deal was cut. Sophie Masloff gets appointed mayor of the city of Pittsburgh. At any rate, what happens is after a year or so till or two till the term ended, and now they're going to run for the actual election for a four-year term. She had promised not to run. She changed her mind. She had done a good job as mayor and had this power, got a lot of things she wanted to get done. There's a court case that went to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court because Frank Lucchino had sued to get her out of the primary based on the promise. And the Pennsylvania Supreme Court famously issued an opinion that, quote, Politicians cannot be held to their promises. Now, there was a legal reason, Greg. There was no consideration for the contract. So there was legal reasoning. But, of course, you know what the press did. See, politicians can't be held to their word, and they had a field day with that. But the end of the story was she got to stay in and then beat him with the power of the mayorship. And so your point is well taken about Speaker Rossi now with that power. And one other thing should be said. He has already had a pretty good group of Republicans willing to switch to vote for him. So he already can say he'll be a bipartisan. And that was obviously, uh, and then he switched independent to make it even more so. So we have interesting times in the House, there's no doubt. I'm glad I'm in the Senate, Chuck. <laughs> well, well, Senator, again, I'm going to end this show with congratulations, heartfelt. You're a friend of mine. I'm a major and will always be supporter of yours because of what you do for this Commonwealth. You're one of the good guys, and you have the future of Pennsylvania. Your line about civility sums up in a nutshell why responsible thinking people would always should, should always support Greg Rothman, and you'll always and, have that for me. And I know you get the last word, but I want to congratulate you uh, uh, on your 10th year of doing this show. So Thanks. congratulations. That, that's great. You do a great service for the Commonwealth, and uh, your viewers, and, and I appreciate you. Thanks so much, Senator. I'm going to call you back to talk about the goings of the Senate. Once our governor-elect submits his first budget a month or so from now, you'll be my first phone call. Thank you, sir. Take care. Thanks, Senator. Happy New Year.